Okay, it's nine o'clock on Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. This is the Policy and Procedure Committee meeting. Call the roll, please, Amanda. Here. 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 Second by Mr. Whitlow. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. The motion passes. Do we have any public comments this morning? No public hearing. We'll go to the EMA report. Mr. Anderson. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Pass off the copies of my monthly report. Okay, it comes on with the bigger points. I know one of the problems that was happened after last meeting was the dollar amount that we decided and you guys voted on for the hazard mitigation plan. You want to talk about that after? We're going to discuss that in a few moments. Okay, we'll wait for that then. I'll take that paragraph because I've spoken to Amanda about that or Andrea about that. Um, as for the grants, um, I continue to file my necessary quarterly reports. The final payment on the last year's grant uh, was concluded in the middle of October. On time, the payment on that should be about $587.83. The new grant has taken effect. I'll be filing those quarterly. Uh, training you can see on there. Uh, committee meetings you can read about. The only one I'm going to touch on uh, my meeting with the uh, Iroquois County Amateur Radio Club that I attend monthly. I have a section in there that, uh, hey, good morning. There's a section in there that uh, they give me the opportunity to speak and uh, back and forth. I've been a member of it for years, but uh, a lengthy discussion was held about uh, being backup communications in case ICOM and CAMCOM go down. It's in the county's EOP that the Amateur Radio Club is to support communications for the county in that. Uh, and we've been discussing quite a bit since I've taken this role. and. At that meeting, the uh, Amateur Radio Club membership voted to spend over $2,000 from the club's coffers uh, on equipment that will improve the capabilities of the club to do just that for us here in the county. We should be able to support uh, inter-county communications. Um, if, if everything fails, that's one of the reasons that ham radio has always been out there. If everything fails, you rely on them for communications. Cell phones go down, repeater towers go down. We should, by the time this all is put in place, be able to communicate anywhere within the county uh, and then radio back to what would be me and the EOC. And then there's other that's coming up on that. Um, I'll move forward just a little bit. I'll come back to that in another part. But um, I've been really pushing because I've been a storm spotter for years, part of the group that I put the stuff together. We are now recognized on October 17th. Iroquois County was recognized as a NOAA Weather Ready Nation Ambassador. You can read about all of the bits and pieces and what that actually allows us to do, but it's the first step in the process of moving us to a storm ready county. Um, there are only 38 other counties in the state of Illinois that have reached that designation. We should be able to reach that without a problem. Uh, like I put in here, nearly 98% of all presidentially declared disasters are weather related. They lead to around 500 deaths a year and $15 billion in damage. The Storm Ready program helps arm America's communities with the communication and safety skills needed to save lives and property before, during, and after the event. Storm Ready helps community leaders and emergencies strengthen their local safety programs. I'm working hard on pushing that through. I'm hoping within the next few months we will meet all of the requirements for that and we'll be able to be recognized as a storm ready county in the state of Illinois. You consider as 102 counties and only 38 reach that level that we'll be able to be in that top group there. Um, part of that I had to write an annex for emergency operations plan which is uh, it puts together a hazardous weather annex. I'm just about complete with that. Um, our hyperreach system, we've been part of hyperreach for a number of years. The county pays $6,300 a year to be part of the program. This is the program that allows us to make no emergency notifications that come through cell phones, landline phones. Uh, I've mentioned before there's an iPause, which is a level up. In fact, the big test that occurred 
last month when all of the cell phones, everything activated, that was actually utilizing the iPod system. It's kind of an upgrade to this. It doesn't cost anymore. You have to have HyperReach in place. But I will be utilizing the HyperReach, uh, and I will be testing it monthly at the same time, the first Tuesday of the month at 10 o'clock when the sirens are being tested. I will be sending out a countywide test page or test notification over HyperReach to uh, allow people to be aware that that's going to take place. And I'll explain a little bit more. I'm not going to overutilize that system. It will only be used for weather warnings and the like because it's an opt-in system. And if you constantly hammer people with, with these information, they'll opt out and they won't be able to get them. It should be utilized for weather warnings, emergencies, and the like. So, uh, email volunteers. What I, this is what I put in here. When I assumed this position August 1st, EMA only had one active volunteer, Michael Johnson. Michael Johnson has been part of EMA for 23 years. He went all the way back to when Carl Gurdovich was running it through all of Eric's administration and into mine. Well, Michael has resigned, actually retired, and he has moved to Texas. So I was going to be completely without my volunteers, but I have bolstered the ranks. I went through the list of people that we had that were active. We had uh, four out of the 10 that we had had at one time that were actually inactive. For whatever reason, they decided to stop coming to the trainings and the meetings. I've encouraged them, and they are. They're more than willing to come back. And I've added to that ranks. Right now, I have about 10, and I have some applications that are left out. Volunteers are imperative to EMA. These are people that are willing to donate their time to helping what would be the county in, in an emergency. So I'm really excited about having the group of people that I'm going to be working with. Uh, I've been given permission by the sheriff's office that everybody can be issued the RFID chips to access what is the courthouse. So they will have access to the, the EOC if need be, which is important. If they don't have access to that when I need them, they can stand outside all they want. They're not going to do me any good. But the sheriff's going to be permission for that. So I'll be putting those lists through once they're vetted because I will be putting everybody through a background check process here in-house. And once that takes place, they'll have access to the courthouse and be able to get down and activate the EOC as needed. Um, the only other thing that I want to put on there is the, uh, the radio room inside the EOC. It's been a little bit crazy since I've been there. I really haven't touched it. I need more hands to do what I need to do. <laughs> Uh, have brought a couple of the volunteers that I have down there. We've gone over some things, going to make some changes. But one of the things that that room has been lacking has been a radio that will allow us to communicate outside of the county with Springfield. If everything fails, if all the radios down or if all the phone lines are down, if Starcom is down, we need to be able to communicate with the state's emergency operations center. The only way that we can do that is actually with a ham radio. I'm going to be bringing in, I've got one of my own that I'm not using, I'm going to bring that in for the piece of equipment so we don't have the expense right away. We'll buy that eventually, but we're going to install an antenna on the roof of the courthouse. I've been working with the sheriff and with, um, with Chris Drake. They're all for this. I won't have to do anything invasive. The cabling is already run. I'll be moving a couple things around, but hopefully if the weather holds out, we're able to do that. It might even be this weekend that I should be able to have that radio up and being able to communicate with the state of Illinois in an emergency. Because if we need to have communications with the state's emergency operations center, this is the only way that we may have the ability to do it. And that's important. The sheriff is all for that. And as am I, I mean, because if we can't ask the state for assistance, if we need it, this is this is because of that, this may be the only way that we can. So. That's pretty much all that I have on this. There's a lot more that you can read when you get the chance. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, went over it pretty well. Okay. Okay. Next item we have is <clears throat> not quite exactly right. I don't know how we got this agenda put together <laughs> this way. I didn't look at it carefully enough. We're not opening bids for hazard medication. No. I must not change that part. It should be discussion and action on hazard mitigation plan. Yeah. Last, last month we opened the bids. We awarded the bid to the, found the lowest bidder was the
American Environmental, I got off. Anyway. It's buried. The contract that they sent to us. What? No, no, I'm Good. sorry. I was talking online. Last, last, let me back up. Last month, we opened the bridge. We approved the bridge from the American Environmental County Board, approved it, everything. Okay. So we got a contract from them. And the amount on the contract is different than what the, what the bid was. Okay. So I'll pass this information around to you. If you will. Okay, what you have here is a series of emails that transpired between Amanda and Henry of Bostwick from this American Environmental regarding the difference in the amount. Long story short, it's my opinion and feeling that we need to go back to Envi American Environmental and have them submit to us a contract or that page for the amount that was in their bid. The difference is <clears throat> an amount projected to cover administrative costs and reporting to the state and so forth on the grant. Scott has indicated he would like them to do that. And they've indicated they will. That's what apparently what the difference is in the cost. So if we're going to have them do that, I think that needs to be handled separately. Because they bid, we go through the bid process, they bid, we accepted their bid, the contract should be reflected with that amount. The extra costs that are incurred should be handled separately. Does that make sense? Well, since then, and yes, you're 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 right. Can I explain after I've talked to Andrea again, and I actually talked to her this morning before the meeting. Um, the process that has taken place, Iroquois County is, is, a, is an, an, is, it's, it's a different than what normally <coughs> takes place. We were awarded the grant in full prior to the submission of bids. We knew how much, they didn't. And according to Andrea, within the state, the state, when, you, when you're awarded a contract, or when you're awarded a grant, and this is funded between FEMA and IEMA, they expect the entity to use the entire grant amount. They were not privy to that amount, which is common, because normally that wouldn't happen. American Environmental, would normally have then submitted to the to FEMA and IEMA for what would be the grant. This was reversed. Very seldomly does that happen, and that's kind of what has ended up happening here. The county board, you guys decided and voted on the amount, which was actually about a month premature, the actual dollar amount, because the numbers that were reflected needed to be compiled after American Environmental was made privy to what the grant was allowing to pay. So the amount of monies that actually needs to be voted on in order to have this whole process, and again, every penny of this is paid for out of the entire grant. And I've lined item it in here. The total amount now is $59,902.33, which reflects the total cost of the environmental envir American Environmental to do the plan in itself. But it also includes the administrative costs of $2,852.49. Yeah, $2, and that allows for them to do all of the nuts and bolts and reporting because you have to keep track of the hours, you have to keep track of everything. And that's what they do. That's when we had this discussion now, the county would be able to, to, to take that money in and pay Jill or Amanda or whoever it was to go through this, but it would involve hours back and forth on the phone. 
it's just, it, it was my opinion to look at that and go, well, if it's included in the grant amount, which again, they were not privy to until after the fact, that that's why that amount for what would be administrative costs is included in the federal grant. So I've specified it all. I typed it all out here. I confirmed all of that information with Andrea again this morning that this is correct. But again, it's it's it very, very few locations ever have the opportunity to have the grant in place prior to the requesting and submission of bids. That just that almost never happens. Okay, the number that you just gave us is quite a bit more than what's included in these emails. Well, that's again, this is what when I took the the, the, the grant okay. itself and that is exactly what's reflected and I can show you I have the what's that number again? Uh, here is the actual here is the actual signed copy that Chairman Schur signed along with what is IEMA's signature. This is the total grant agreement. The total grant agreement is fifty nine nine oh two thirty three, which is what is reflected here. That total grant agreement includes the 57 <coughs> costs to put the grant or to put the, the hazardous material plan together. And it also includes the $2,850.49 of administrative costs. That is the total grant amount. That is how much that we are uh, approved to, 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 in, to spend on the entire amount. That's, I understand that, but he also said something that certainly is not correct, and that is that we do not share the amount of the grant with somebody before the bids are submitted. Oh, well, I, they didn't ask me for it. I didn't give them the information. You, you made that statement. You said that they made their bid without knowing. Well, I think what he was trying to say was normally you get the bids, and then whoever gets the bid applies for the grant. Correct. That's the normal procedure. So we were ahead of the game getting the grant first. Correct, which has actually sped the process up immensely. It still leaves us with the position of where they, they submitted a bid, another firm submitted a bid, we awarded the bid, on the, the thing on the basis of the bid that was submitted. We're going to be spending additional monies that I think should needs to be handled separately. And if that's for administrative costs for the grant, I certainly don't see a problem in handling it. But I think we need to have a contract from Andrea for the amount of their bid. That so contract is recorded in the county's so you, want, you want two contracts, and one for the bid and <coughs> one for the right. right. Well, so what you're saying is is the bid amount that they that they put forth is going to be less than the amount that the, the that FEMA has allowed us to spend because it was 55 something what, what did we approve what did you guys approve last month 55 90320 right that's going to fall short of the 570484 I understand well what that what she explained to me this morning is is I'm sure that they can still go ahead and do what you're asking but it may involve a delay because that's going to have to go back through and a rewrite of what I guess would be this. I'm not, I'm not positive. This is the first time I've had to deal with this. Sounds but, to me like all they have to do is to redo the price pages that are in the, in the contract. They well, send us and send those and we'll put them in there and we got something. In there. That's what we're looking for. So you won't, even though the amount that what you're talking about is going to exceed what they originally had in their proposal, as long as they rewrite that to reflect this 57 and the two two thousand. We're, we're getting confused. Okay. We need a contract for the fifty five thousand dollar amount, the amount that they originally bid. That's what we accepted. We need a contract for that amount, or we need to go through the whole bid process again. The other bidder, even though their price was a lot higher, you know we have to we have to treat them fairly. We can't, have, we can't accept a bid from somebody and then it just arbitrarily increases. That, that, you know, the other bidder is being disenfranchised in a in the sense that way. I see what you're saying. What we need is a contract with American Environmental for the amount that they bid originally. Okay. 
there's going to be some additional cost because we're going to authorize them to do additional work. I understand. So we're going to cover that separately. Or they can submit us a proposal. We will accept that and have a contract for that amount. Okay. I okay. think that's that's the way we need to proceed. That Understood. way, there's, everybody is clean. There's no questions, <clears throat> so forth. You agree okay. with that, Mr. Silver? Uh, I do. I'm just confused on. So you were already awarded that yes. grant. The grant has been awarded for a period, of, quite a period of time. It was actually signed. It was signed um, back in April by the chairman and by the state. Then how did they approve it if you didn't submit any money? Because normally you have grants right. that work either way. That's why this has been an anomaly. Okay. So, but Welcome that's the state of Illinois. It was also, like I said, it was just explained to me that if the amount that's on here is different <coughs> from the amount that's being awarded, it may create a problem in time because it's going to have to go through a different process within the state because the grant amount right. will be more than what's actually going to be spent. And I guess they don't like to have monies no. returned to them. Well, and that was going to be my, uh, I mean, well, you, you haven't gotten any of that money yet, though. Absolutely right? not. No, so and we will not be dealing with it until after January at the earliest. We still have time. I'm just trying to think of the cleanest way for you to do it without having issues trying to get the reimbursement. You know what I mean? I don't want no, to I understand. And that's, that's what I had spelled out here, and that was kind of reflected in the emails that were being exchanged. And that's why I made sure I talked with her this morning again to confirm that this is the way that would be the cleanest and the easiest way to go forward. But I totally understand what Chairman is saying. This is if this was the amount that was voted on because this is the amount that was reflected right. in the bids. In order to be fair to the other company, I can understand that. But again, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go back to them and say, hey, how what what kind of a time frame are we looking at if we have to modify what is the grant? to reflect the money that they bid because that's going to reduce this amount. I'm sure the administrative costs will remain the same, which we will make, I will make sure that they have a separate contract for that. It's just a matter of that $1,700 difference mm -hmm. may in, incur a, a time issue in order to get this thing moving forward. The way I read it, that extra money, we could have used that to pay Amanda and you Jill to do this. Very easily could Or have. we can do what we're Absolutely. doing and outsource it. You can, so you can still make that decision. That should be, since that's an option, then that shouldn't really complicate things. No, I, I understand exactly. If you want a separate contract for that because it's specified in this, that won't be a problem. The dollar amount that this is allowing for can easily be put into a contract, I'm sure, that they will submit, which is separate from what was the proposed amount. Because again, they weren't privy to this information when they sent the bid packets out because that's not normally what takes place. And so, if but they would have submitted a bid to us that didn't include the administrative cost, then we'd be stuck with that amount anyway. Uh, you know, above if they originally bid the full contract of, of our, the full grant amount, <coughs> we'd be stuck with the administrative cost part. Actually, to me, it's better this way if their bid is less than. The, Grand award because that that's where the administrative costs are, are covered. Whether we do it ourselves or whether we, I mean, we could hire Joe Blow administrative firm to, to do that part of the too, could we not? You don't have I, to hire American Environmental. I'm not, again, I'm not certain about that. I just know that it involves a lot of the, the back and forth and the hours and the reporting the way it was expressed to me. So that's all your know, guy's decision. All I know is. You have her send me I will. the pages with the right amount on it. We'll put them in the contract that she's already submitted. We'll replace them. I will sign it, and then and there we go. Okay. And then and she can send us a proposal for the other part. Okay. That shouldn't that should be sufficient for her to get started on the job. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we again, we don't really have to worry about anything that will involve billing until after January, anyways. So we do have time. So is the first meeting we have scheduled right now is for January eighteenth. Okay. So very good. Thank you, everybody. I guess we got that taken care of. We'll move on to the <laughs> chair reports. 
We'll begin with Mr. Barron from Management Services. Um, I take regular reports, which at this point includes org. Okay. This is new cat ARPA. Uh, we got three applications <coughs> left, and one of them is for the more. Good. This is awful house committee. Yeah, we'll have our regular reports along with the uh, yeah. And you should do cat tax. We'll have our regular reports. Well, you'll have something else that we'll mm -hmm. be talking about here in a few minutes relative to the building. Right. With the, yes, with codes. I agree with that. But nothing with uh, Cameron or Devon yet. Yeah. We'll talk about it in a minute, but when we, when we get down to the discussion on the, on the manual, I want to cover that too. You might also want to include the levy discussion. What's that? The discussion on the levy for tax. Yep. You hear that? I heard that. Okay. That was loud and clear. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Mr. Winlow, judicial. You've got a new deputy and correctional officers in training right now. Uh, the deputy is 16 weeks, uh, correctional officer eight weeks. Uh, they're working on the radio system. Uh, there is a population decrease over the jail naturally because of the new law and, uh, that they put in place where they can't, you know, got to go before the judge. And it's, it's I don't know if that's a positive, I guess it is. <laughs> Less people in there. Positive for, for the county, as far as expense, I suppose. Um, getting the free, we got a free breathalyzer that the state donated to us. Those are quite costly. Uh, got the <coughs> table reported an additional salary for the uh, public defenders from the state that just came in, which is $83,000. Uh, and most of the grand jury cases that they had a couple weeks back are all pretty much all drug related. So you can read into that what you want, but it says that, you know, it's got a problem. And money for the public defenders is something we have to keep an eye on because number one, we don't know if that's sustainable, and number two, we don't know where that money's coming from. It's because your house designated to be used, but it's not that either. Sustainability is very important, and where it's coming from is equally important. How come we don't know where it's coming from? Well, the state has ways of accomplishing that, where they maybe take away some money that we'd be getting from over here and take it and put it over here. So we are the ones that wind up paying for it versus them paying for it. So we Disper need, disbursement. We need we need to we need to keep our eyes open and, and for both of those. Okay. Finance Mr. Barons. I imagine we'll be finalizing the budget. I hope so. If we don't, we're in big trouble. Has there been any uh, objections to the budget since it's been on display? No. Okay. Nope. I've had nobody reach out. So. That's good. Okay. Highway, anyway, Mr. All. Yeah, we'll have our normal claims, and I understand we have a new hire. I don't know what that is. I'll have to learn more when I get to her on what it is, but I still. I've been also told we're still looking for another new hire, new hire. So, I guess that might be part of the shop that we were looking for at that before now with two people. Um, and um, Greg told me we can look over a couple of resolutions on the uh, director's salary for the future. I don't understand. I didn't realize there was two different options you can go. So I got a lot to learn there. I don't think we have to make any decisions on it. Certainly, we better study it and work on it because New Year's coming pretty fast. And uh, that's where I, we have no <coughs> on a new director out there yet or, or, or interviews of anybody. I want to, when we're done with our meeting today, I want to talk to you, Mr. Duquette, about that. Okay? I think that takes care of the committee chair reports. We'll go to 
Chairman, comments, reports. Is there any update on sexual harassment training? Uh, we're currently sitting at 92%. Uh, we'll do a final push because this is about the time to do that. And, and see if we can get any higher. is where we were last month. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. Holiday schedule for 2024. Everybody should have a copy of that in front of them. Any, any questions about the holiday schedule? We don't, we don't arrange the calendar, so will the holidays fall where they will. But we're required to approve that schedule, so appreciate a motion to do so. Any other questions or comments about the holiday? <coughs> except for the organizational session in, in December, which is not a Monday. Do we have a motion to approve that schedule, Mr. Duque? Do we have a second? Mr. Wendell? Are there any questions or comments on the schedule for the county board meetings? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. All right, thanks. Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. That takes us to continued discussion on the Iroquois <coughs> County Code Manual. Before we get into that, it was brought to my attention this week that there's some need for updating our building codes and there may be a grant. Not sure why we need a grant, but there may be a grant available to do that. Chapter 8 of our county code is buildings and building regulations, including building code, electrical code, plumbing code, residential code, and property maintenance code. That's a couple of sections down from where we are in re our review of the book right now. My thought is that maybe we should send this to the zoning committee and uh, have them analyze this uh, possible grant situation and the need for it and uh, that can report back to us next month i think by that time we'll have some idea whether we want the zoning committee to take care of all this if we want to farm this out to somebody for wanting to pay on the grant i don't know the, exactly where we're at with any of that or the need for it because i think most of our codes relate to the established codes from the federal and state anyway, but nevertheless, I think the zoning committee would be the one to take care of that and tell us what to do. Is that agreeable? Yep. <laughs> so you can put that on your agenda for next Tuesday? Will do. All right. Very good. So that brings us back to the, where we left off last month animals. I believe we were on page 16, beginning on page 16, is that correct? If you don't remember. I don't remember. That was a long time ago. I believe it was. That sounds right. That's where my atmosphere came up in. We were talking about, on page 15, where it talks about the uh, Any, anybody's uh, you know, livestock and so forth that gets 
go to the buy the dog and what they get reimbursed for. If there's a whole schedule. Oh, I remember that one. We're going to talk about raising the price. Yep. Page 16 gets into definitions of dangerous dogs and vicious dogs. To me, that right in and of itself by the, by the title of it can be dangerous because it's up to interpretation. Is a dog dangerous? Is a dog vicious? Is it either any of those things? So we've got definitions here, and I think the definitions are pretty, pretty significant. Dangerous dog means any individual dog which, when either unmuzzled, unleashed, or unattended by its owner or a member of its owner's family in a vicious or terrorizing manner approaches any person in an apparent attitude of attack upon streets, sidewalks, or any public grounds or places. <coughs> to me that says if you have your yard if that's not a public place and you, you enter that property and the dog comes over there and attacks you it's, it's not being dangerous it's our yard I mean this and I'm, at, I'm saying this because is this the way we want it to be or is this the way it should be this is this is the reason we're looking at this is to, to make certain that what we have here is, is correct, the way we want it to be, what have you. Uh, if it needs to be changed, this is the time to do it. If we're happy with it the way it is, if we think it encompasses everything that's needed to be covered, I think that's fine too. But we need to understand that because this is something if, if incident like this happened and it went into court, this is something they could go back to and say, well, look, there's the county code. It says this, my dog was within its rights or it wasn't within its rights. So it's important. I think if it's an offense and, you know, someone comes in their yard and the dog has the right to protect his property. Well, this doesn't say anything about offense. Next paragraph right. talks about a fence, but this talks about what is a dangerous dog, and the dog is dangerous. If it attacks somebody on the street, sidewalk, or public ground, or public place. Right. So. Well, if it's not contained with a leash or something. If you go into somebody's house and the dog attacks you, yeah. it's, it's not going to be a dangerous dog. No. Well, that's not a that's not a sidewalk or street or public ground. Okay, I guess we, nobody wants to change it, so we'll move on to the next one. Enclosure means a fence or structure of at least six feet in height, forming or causing an enclosure suitable to prevent the entry of young children and suitable to confine a vicious dog in conjunction with other measures which may be taken by the owner or keeper, such as tethering of a vicious dog. Such enclosure shall be securely enclosed and locked and designed with secure sides, top and bottom, and shall be designed to prevent the animal from escaping from the enclosure. Satisfactory the way it's written. Move on. Impounded means taken into the custody of the public pound or shelter in the city or town where the vicious dog is found. That's our animal control building. Run line means a system of tying a dog in place with either rope or chain having a tensile strength of at least 300 pounds. 
I can't remember for sure, but if you go over here to the running store, or if you go to Barron's Hardware Store in Onaga, or any place that might sell some of these kind of, that kind of equipment, do all those things have 300 pound tensile or greater? There's different. But some are less. Yes. But a Chihuahua doesn't need 300 pounds <laughs> either. Do we want to leave it at the way it's written, or do we want to make a change? Three hundred pounds might is that going to be sufficient to restrain a, a dog that weighs one hundred and fifty pounds or, or so, some real big dog? I'm sure it's enough to retain a restrain a chihuahua or some some little dog, but some of the big dogs. Even a 300 pound one, when they, if they go running and hit the end of that, they'll snap the snaps on them. But there's nothing you can, I mean. Well, the other thing, the other thing is that those lines rust after a period of time and that greatly weakens their strength. You know, eventually break. Yeah. It, So what is, how does all that apply to what we have in our ordinance? Is that something that's going to, from a legal standpoint or some other standpoint, be something that's important? If somebody had their dog tied out and you're walking down the sidewalk and the dog breaks loose and comes over and attacks you and so forth, you can prove that that run line more than 300 pounds tensile strength? Is that, is that strength in your case? Or Contingent on the size of the dog, maybe. But I'm saying, yeah. you know, <coughs> this, this is something, so yeah, if somebody wants to know how can I operate within the county code, so this is where you look and say, okay, but now if something happens and you go to court, mm -hmm. A serious injury. We've had some serious injuries in this county from dog attacks. We've had some recently who are very serious. And I'd be surprised if they don't wind up in court somehow or some, some legal activity. So I think somebody's going to go back to this and say, well, look, this is what, what we're required to do. So who gets the leash? You have something, Doug? I didn't know if you could tie it into a factor of three times the weight of the dog. And that way a chihuahua doesn't need to have a 300 pound chain dragging around. He wouldn't be able to move it. Exactly, so if you said some factor of based on weight, yeah. would that help? I guess, I guess I'm not sure if a dog is running at full speed like Ohio said and reaches the end of the rope and snaps it or what. Correlation there is, you know, as far as the strength goes. That's a well, I'm sure sure and all that. I'm, there's a formula that I'm sure you can figure that out. Loose dog. Loose dog. Yeah. To be out. It is. I don't, know what the, I don't know what the formula would be to, to determine that. I'm just saying if we threw in a factor saying the owner must uh, tether the dog four, with the tensile strength the four times the dog's weight. Then we put the onus on him to have the right, the right size tether. I, I, right, I understand what you're saying. What, what I'm saying is, is three, four, or five times the weight of the dog sufficient. Well, you have to be practical as to what's available too. Yeah. There are weather factors involved in that too. It can be whether it's freezing cold out on that. How much? How quick that's going to snap? as opposed to the middle of summer. I mean, there's all kinds of factors. Well, I may be mistaken, and I guess Joe isn't in the room right now, but I, I maybe, I don't know if you re recall, Amanda, on some of the, or, or Barbara, some of the reports we've got, has there been some dogs that were chained up with a link chain? <coughs> According to this, I mean, that's permissible. It says a run line. It doesn't say whether that's, it has to be a rope or right. cable or chain or whatever have you. But 
It, you can have whatever tensile strength you want on the thing if they rip it out of the side of the wall that it's fastened to. I, I guess I guess that's you know it, it all depends on how it's secured. They have anchors that they put in the ground. That's if he breaks me for it for any reason after that, he's considered a vicious dog. What I'm seeing is cables are not rated as to their tensile strength of weight, at least not readily. They're more rated by the weight of the dog. So uh, that may be hard for people to even find something that's rated for a 300 pound tensile rate. It's going to be rated for a 125 pound dog. So I don't know. Well, maybe keep it the way it is. I mean, I don't have a problem keeping it the way it is, other than as I'm saying, from a legal standpoint, the, 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 you know, the implication of this is that this going before a judge and lawsuit, and somebody suing somebody, the lawyers look at every possible angle they can find. And if somebody can prove and say, well, my dog. I was, I was following the regulations with my dog. How can I be liable? So the only, the only other way to do it would be to say, have a, a lead appropriate for the size of the dog or something. Reasonable tensile strength. You know, because then if they, if they got a chihuahua and they buy a 15 pound, you know, a small dog one, Versus if they have a Rottweiler and they buy a large dog one, if they bought one that should reasonably be expected to do it. The reasonable tensile strength of said dog. My, my problem with the use of the word reasonable is that yeah. what's reasonable to me is not reasonable yeah. to somebody else. Appropriate. Same, same difference. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure I have I'm not, saying, I'm not suggesting that those are words that a reasonable person, or what we consider to be a reasonable person, might recognize and follow, but what's reasonable to one person. It's obvious if you look at things going on in the world today, what's reasonable in some parts of the world, or <coughs> wars and other things that happen, it's not reasonable to other people. Charlie? I think a dog can bite you what, even if he's tied up in a leech like that, if you happen to step into his range, and if he didn't know if the dog house was even there. I've been in situations like that. You know, I, I it scares the hell out of me. Yeah. I was lucky he didn't was some vicious, but he was right here. Well, I, I, I understand that, and I agree with that. Well, I don't know what this distance stuff and weights might mean much. The dog is on a leash, or uh, not on a leash, and he bites you. You went on a proper leash, period. Okay, so, uh, so do we want to leave it the way it is, or do we want to change it? I guess that's the question. better off to leave it like it is. This weights, <laughs> I don't get. I would leave it alone. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on, vicious dog. A vicious dog means. Any individual dog that, when unprovoked, inflicts bites or attacks a human being or other animal, either on either on public or private property. Any individual dog with a known propensity, tendency, or disposition to attack without provocation to cause injury or to otherwise endanger the safety of human beings or domestic animals. So, if you have a history of doing that. Declared to be a vicious dog. I think we have some dogs in the county that, have, that where we've done that, have we not, Amanda? Do you recall? Number three, any individual dog which attacks a human being or a domestic animal without provocation. Well, that's the same thing as number one, I think. Number four, an individual dog which has been found to be a dangerous dog upon three separate occasions. What if I'm bitten in the first occasion? 
you get three, you get three, chests, three strikes and you're out. I guess. Or it turns like this. I'll make up two more or something. I, yeah. I'm calling my buddies and said I was bit, bit, bit there last week, but I didn't get didn't get didn't get sick over it. It says here in number five on the next page, no dog shall be deemed vicious if it bites, attacks, or menaces, or a trespasser on the property of its owner, or harms or menaces anyone who has tormented or abused it, or is a professionally trained dog for law enforcement or guard duties. I think number five is pretty good the way it is. And then we have exemptions, guide dogs for the blind or hearing impaired, support dogs for the physically handicapped, accelerant detection dogs, sentry guard or police owned dogs are exempt from this article, provided an attack or injury to a person occurs while the dog is performing duties as expected. To qualify for exemption under this section, each such dog Shall be currently inoculated against rabies in accordance with section 6-290. It shall be the duty of the owner of such exempted dog to notify the administrator of changes of address. In the case of a sentry or guard dog, the owner shall keep the administrator advised of the location where such dog will be stationed. The administrator shall provide police and fire departments with a categorized list of such exempted dogs and shall promptly notify such departments of any address changes reported to him. I am not aware that uh, we have any dogs in the county right now that are in group or fall under this. If we have some, then we're not following the code. I have seen some people with support I guess they call them support dogs, or they call them comfort dogs. I don't know. Yeah. They take them around the stores and places like that. I think that's where some of this can apply if you go to Walmart with your dog or Runnings or wherever, and that, you know you're in the store shopping and it bites somebody. Now what? <laughs> Now, it, I, to me, I guess this is fine the way they, you know that they are required to notify the administrator and be registered as such. So, no reason to change any of that. <clears throat> Move on to Division Two vicious dogs. There's a procedure in order to have a dog deemed vicious. The administrator, deputy administrator, or law enforcement officer must give notice of the infraction that is the basis of the investigation to the owner. Conduct a thorough investigation, interview witnesses, including the owner, gather any existing medical records, veterinary medical records, or behavioral evidence. Make a detailed report recommending a finding that the dog is a vicious dog, and give the report to the state's attorney's office and the owner. Administrator, state's attorney, director, or any citizen of the county in which the dog exists may file a complaint in the circuit court in the name of the people of the state to deem a dog to be a vicious dog. Testimony of a certified applied behaviorist, a board certified veterinary behaviorist, or other recognized expert may be relevant to the court's determination of whether the dog's behavior was justified. The petitioner must prove the dog is a vicious dog by clear and convincing evidence. The administrator shall determine where the animal shall be confined during the pendency of the case. Do we know if that incident that happened was in Sheldon a few months back? Is there any of that related to the, this related to any of that? I wasn't really involved in any of that. You haven't had any report at the health committee about that either. I'm not sure what, I mean, that sounded to me like a, an incident where a child was hurt pretty seriously. And maybe that dog should have been, I don't know what, what the outcome was with the dog. The dog was quarantined for rabies, I believe, but we never heard of it had rabies. 
didn't have rabies, then I would think what's, what's in their coverage should have been activated. But we don't know if it was. <laughs> I guess I don't think there's anything in there that needs to be changed, so we can move on there. A dog may not be declared. This is page on page 18. A dog may not be declared vicious if the court determines the conduct of the dog was justified because the threat, injury, or death was sustained by a person who at the time was committing a crime or offense upon the owner or custodian of the dog, or was committing a willful trespass or other tort upon the premises or property owned or occupied by the owner of the animal. I think that's fine. I think many people, especially people who live out in the country and have a dog, relying upon the dog to help guard their property and so forth. <clears throat> Number two, the injured, threatened, or killed person was abusing, assaulting, or physically threatening the dog or its offspring or has in the past abused, assaulted, or physically threatened the dog. That's fine. Number three, the dog was responding to pain or injury and it was protecting itself, its owner, custodian, or member of its household, kennel, or offspring. No dog shall be deemed vicious if it is a professionally trained dog for law enforcement or guard duty. Vicious dogs shall not be classified in a manner that is specific as to breed. If the burden of proof has been met, the court shall deem the dog to be a vicious dog. If a dog is found to be a vicious dog, the owner shall pay $100 public safety fine to be deposited into the pet population control fund. The dog shall be spayed or neutered within 10 days of the finding at the expense of its owner and microchipped, if not already, and the dog is subject to enclosure. If an owner fails to comply with these requirements, the animal control agency shall impound the dog and the owner shall pay a $500 fine plus impoundment fees to the animal control agency impounding the dog. The judge has the discretion to order a vicious dog to be euthanized. A dog found to be a vicious dog shall not be released to the owner until the administrator, <coughs> animal control officer, or the director approves the enclosure. I guess my question on this one is the going back to the beginning, the hundred dollar public safety fine, is that adequate? <coughs> Be the way it is. You want to increase it? Yeah, I say you do. You think a hundred dollar fine is sufficient? Okay. What about the five hundred dollar fine? Mm -hmm. Is that the way it is too? Yeah, common fees are in top of that too. Five hundred dollar fine plus in common fees. You only know, has to pay the five hundred dollar fee if he fails to comply with the requirements of having the dog spayed or moved. Not quite sure. Some type of the code. If you don't comply with that, then you got to pay the five hundred dollar fine. Right. Yeah. Plus some pounds. <coughs> okay. I would have thought we might want to make it more. I saw him under that. That's fine. Too. How much more are you talking? Mm -hmm. How much more are you talking? Well, this is this is stuff that was done ten years ago. Okay. Costs today are a lot more than they were ten years ago. This is from 2014. Now we're looking at 2024. Ten years. Give us some time. If you make it too much, they're just gonna have the dog euthanized. Yeah. So. 
some people would say that'd be all right. Yeah, if you got a vicious dog, or a dog that's causing trouble, and it's one thing to have a guard dog that's going to bark or feel yeah. the next door, I'd say that would be a good trade. If the dog Kill is it. protecting its owner or family, I don't see that anybody has a problem with that. That's what dogs, one of the things yeah. dogs are for. Most dogs are not going to do that unless there's a valid reason to do it. So when when you have a dog in a situation where a dog is doing that, such as this one in Shelton, I think it's important that we that we have to take some pretty definitive action to prevent it from happening again. And I'm sure the owner of the dog probably would say, "Well, wait a minute, that's my my dog," you know, but nevertheless, the dog is going to. Do it right. You have to protect other people. That's right. I think that's what a lot of this lays the groundwork for protecting other people. Sometimes you don't know the dog is vicious until it happens. I mean, we had a dog that uh, uh, bit a little girl at our house, and um, there was no warning, no growl, nothing. You know, he just bit her in the face. So, you know, I took it upon myself because if I tried giving it away to somebody else, that wouldn't be right. So I went and had him euthanized. Because a vet said that's not good if they're not going to give a warning. It was hard to do, but it still did it, you know. Well, I, and I understand, and I think that's the right thing to do. The problem is not everybody's going to do the right thing, and so when they don't, then this I gotta think if this comes before a, a, a judge, he's gonna look at the county code as well because, like I said, lawyers are gonna look at it too. Say this is the county regulations. This is what they go by. Like 200, 150, what? Well, I mean, I would say at least 150 would be my thinking. <laughs> well, I can go along with that. What's everybody think? It isn't, it isn't going to, I don't know, I just think it's in keeping with, with, the, with the, what the cost of everything with inflation and so forth. That's one of the main reasons we keep raising some of our fees and fines. Um, it's, not yeah, of, it's not a matter of the county going broke or not because it, it's not going to enrich us to any degree. Yeah. It's more a deterrent or more an indication that how serious the matter is. So I think I think from that standpoint, sure should be increased. People might be less likely to want to harbor or maintain a vicious dog, a potentially vicious dog, if they understand that we take it serious. I would I personally would Sounds good to me. Okay, let's do that. There, going on, paragraph F says that whenever an owner of a vicious dog relocates, he shall notify both the administrator of county animal control where he's relocated and the administrator of county animal control where he formerly resided. The owner of the dog has not appealed the impoundment order to the circuit court in the county in which the animal was impounded within 15 working days. The dog may be euthanized. I don't understand. I don't quite understand that. If the owner of the dog has not appealed the impoundment order to the circuit court in which the animal was impounded, 15 working days, the dog may be used to oh, yeah. So if the vicious dog is impounded, they don't appeal it, then yeah. they yeah, can so yeah. Don't come and clean your dog. So the animal controls got the dog, and they don't appeal it. In 15 days, the dog may be used Who would want a vicious dog anyway? I mean, it's not fair to the dog, I know, but I think of people before animals. I'll even think of you. Well, I appreciate that. that. Where does it say when you impound a dog? No, I mean, what is that? Is that an end of thing? Does the, owner have to do, does the owner have to do something to get the dog back? Yeah, it's building on what was above it. There was an appeal process above it. 
below it. So not a real important. Okay, I knew I had read it somewhere, but there's an appeal process. So, so if you're if you're impounding the dog, impounding the dog, so that, and, and so you're going to euthanize the dog unless the owner appeals the impoundment order to the circuit court. So once somebody says we're impounding the dog, that's a death sentence for the dog. For a vicious dog. Right. That's what we're talking about. Yes. Okay. But then there's the process of appealing that you can say, well, it's not a vicious dog because that guy came around every week and hit him on the head with a stick and that's why he bit him. You know, that would be part of the appeal process. I know the feeling. Okay. I guess I guess I think I understand it, but I'm not sure it's clearly identified here. A mailman comes on around every day and right. he get disgusted with that. They sometimes go after a mailman just because he wakes him up every day from his nap. That's why some mailmen have treats. They hate dogs. Yeah. That's why they Mace. hate them. I think, I, think, I think that paragraph H clarifies it to some extent in that it says upon filing a notice of appeal, the order of euthanasia shall be automatically stayed pending the outcome of the appeal. The owner shall bear the burden of timely notification to animal control and the writing. So that's saying... <coughs> Impoundment is for the purpose of euthanasia. Okay. Next section says it shall be unlawful for any person to keep or maintain any dog which has been found to be a vicious dog unless such dog is at all times kept in an enclosure. The only times that a vicious dog may be allowed out of the enclosure are if it is necessary for the owner or keeper to obtain veterinary care for the vicious dog, or in the case of an emergency or natural disaster where the dog's life is threatened. To comply with the order of a court of competent jurisdiction provided that a said vicious dog is securely muzzled and restrained with a leash not exceeding six feet in length and shall be under the direct control and supervision of the owner or keeper of the dog or muzzle in its residence. Okay, with all that. So even the house is not considered an enclosure? It would have to be muzzled inside of its own house? Different. Choice. Oh, it's it's direct control of supervision of the owner or the keeper of the dog or muzzle in its residence, yes. It doesn't say that the house isn't an enclosure. Well, it says it must be muzzled in its residence. So I would assume that means any place where it is, has contact with humans. Well, in one place it says that, and one other place it doesn't. <coughs> the dog's residence, muzzle and its residence. So you muzzle oh. inside the home home. Inside the dog house even. What it says. I know, yeah. Because if he breaks out, you want to make it, you want to change that in any way? I. How would you change it? I don't know. I don't know if it needs to be changed. It's just. I can see where it's maybe not real clear because there's an either or in there and so forth in a couple places. What's the word its? Referring to the dog's what, residence or the yes. owner's residence or what? 
I would say it refers to the dog. Yeah, I think so. It has to. Because it, yeah. I mean, that's kind of saying it needs to be muzzled at all times unless it's in a specific structure where only it is at. I would, I would think, let's say I had a vicious dog and, and so did you, and I went over to visit you with my dog. I could put my dog in your enclosure, right? And go inside your house. And, and then the neighbors it. start betting on it? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> for, to, for the night's activity, huh? Taking bets. I, I don't don't know why you'd be bringing a vicious dog to my house. <laughs> that is against the law. Dog <laughs> fights are against the law. That's covered by you another. I'm saying, if you had a vicious dog and you have an enclosure, if I also had a vicious dog and, and I came over to your house to visit with you, I could put my dog in your enclosure and go inside your house and visit with you. Yeah, that's so permissible. I don't know. Well, it's not its enclosure, it's two dogs somebody else's. But outside. it's an enclosure. The dog is in an enclosure. If it's a dog fight, it's illegal. <laughs> they bet on it. Yeah. Maybe he's got a male dog and I got a female dog. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. 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 I don't know that there's any way to change it. Well, it's, uh, I think, refers to the dog. Right. Not the home of the owner. I think if it said the owner's residence. Okay, the next one is any dog which has been found to be a vicious dog and which is not confined to an enclosure shall be impounded by the law enforcement authority having jurisdiction in such area and shall be turned over to a licensed veterinarian for destruction by lethal injection. If you have, if Lyle has a vicious dog and he has an enclosure and the dog gets out of that enclosure and animal control comes and gets the dog, it says here that are required to take it right away to be euthanized. Shall be, it so. says, it doesn't mm -hmm. say maybe, it shall be. But can, how can they right. do that? Don't they want to check them out for rabies before they kill them? No. No? You don't check them out for rabies before you oh, kill them. Oh, it's after they're dead. They kill them and separate the head and send it down to Springfield. For oh, well, thank you for that. That's what they do. I don't have to do that. So. Gross. But this says if the dog escapes, the animal patrol gets them, they have to. Have to That's what we want. <clears throat> well, who decided at the moment that it's a vicious dog? Mm -hmm. Who at well, the moment decided it was a vicious dog? It, it would have had to have previously <laughs> determined. Right. Yeah, that, that's, previously that's, determined. We, we, went through that. we, we just finished going through that part of how you how to determine a vicious dog. The judge can determine that. Just before he got ready, they will have vicious. <laughs> But this is saying that this can be done right away. Yes. But who well, has time with a judge? No, to no, it's already been determined. So you've had a dog that's been determined vicious. You take it home. Found you me. put it in an enclosure. It gets out. Well, it's already determined at that point. And animal control knows that dog because it's been determined to be vicious. So it gets out. They take it. It's euthanized. All right, so my question to that is, then, uh, <clears throat> it's never been vicious before, then? No, it was, it was, it was already the determined. Time. Then, well, that, then that like goes it. way up to the top of everything, and you start the process. This, <clears throat> this only applies to a dog which has been found to be vicious. It's already happened. Okay, just don't want any mistakes. No, I'm just, again, this is pretty... And so shall be euthanized. That's pretty definite. So. Yeah. <clears throat> the last one says no owner or keeper of a vicious dog shall sell or give away any vicious dog without approval from the administrator or the court. If you've got a vicious dog, you're stuck with them unless to get approval if you want to get rid of it. Serious? That's what it says. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would anybody want to buy it? Why would you want to sell it to somebody? <laughs> well, 
I know. Yeah. Some people sell things they don't want. Some all the time. They sell things they don't want. Mm -hmm. Go over to, go, go to, go to Gilman on the last Saturday of the month to junk in the trunk. Yeah. And <laughs> well, they do pretty good. <laughs> Okay, next section is dangerous dog. Dangerous dog says after a thorough investigation, including sending within 10 business days of the administrator or director becoming aware of the alleged infraction, notifications to the owner of the alleged infractions, the fact of the initiation of an investigation and affording. The owner an opportunity to meet with the administrator or director prior to the making of a determination, gathering of any medical or veterinary evidence, interviewing witnesses, and making a detailed written report an animal control officer, deputy administrator, or law enforcement agent may ask the administrator or his designee or the director to deem a dog to be dangerous. No dog shall be deemed a dangerous dog unless shown to be a dangerous dog by a preponderance of evidence. The owner shall be sent immediate notification of determination by registered or certified mail that includes a complete description of the appeal process. So that's saying that if we, if we use an example that incident from Sheldon, that dog, if all of this investigation so forth was conducted and so forth, the, Joe, who's the administrator, determined it's a dangerous dog. This is what she does. She notifies the owner that that's a dangerous dog. Is that the way we want to leave that? Okay. Yeah. Next one says a dog shall not be declared dangerous if the administrator or his designee or the director determines the conduct of the dog was justified because the threat was sustained by a person who at the time was committing a crime or offense upon the owner or custodian of the dog or was committing a willful trespass or other tort upon the premises or property occupied by the owner of the animal. Um, if you drive over to Walmart and leave your dog in the car and somebody comes over there and wants to steal your car and breaks the window and your dog bites him, that dog is okay. That dog is doing its job. Yeah. Good boy. What, what is a willful trespass? You, when if you go on somebody's property knowingly going on their property trespassing normally with the, normally with the intent to commit a crime that's normally a, an ingredient involved with that determination you just gave two different ones going the owner knows he's coming no the person trespassing knows they're trespassing If you have no trespassing signs posted on your property and somebody comes on your property, not, then you got a, a, an interesting dilemma because that may or may not be trespassing, even though it's posted. <coughs> if you don't have it posted, you definitely are there. You can't stop them from coming on your property. If they come on your property to commit a crime, that's a different matter. Is that right? Well, if it's posted, it becomes criminal trespassing versus trespassing. That's the way I understood it. If he commits a crime. If he didn't know he's on his property. That's why it has to be posted yeah. every so often. But if you can get on somebody's property very easily, even if it's posted at another place, you know, it didn't happen to see it. That's what it's supposed to be every so often. Doesn't say that anywhere here. Well, that's trespassing laws. <clears throat> Which now include the fact that you don't even have to put a sign in every place. You can just paint it purple. Yeah, there's purple trespassing paint out there. That was a law that Barrington supported. You sell that in your store? We have had it. I don't know if we have it right now. I think it ought to be publicly studied on that, or at least notified, because I didn't know purple meant trespassing. No trespassing. <laughs> it might have been a Halloween prank. 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's pretty far out to me. Well, I guess that really doesn't apply to this very much. So. Well, it looks like it's be far out later. Right? Wasn't in this. I didn't read the other statement. I got to read both of them. <laughs> Number two says a threatened person was abused, assaulting, or physically threatened a dog or so. Pretty clear. Number three, the injured, threatened, or killed companion animal is attacking or threatening to attack the dog or its offspring. Four, the dog was responding to pain or injury or was protecting itself, its owner, custodian, or a member of its household, kennel, or offspring. I think that's correct the way it is. I just think that a lot of people are not always aware. Like, for example, let's say that a dog gets hit by a car. Somebody runs over there to try and help the dog, and the dog bites him. The dog is... He's got to fight back at anything. The dog is not committing a problem when it does that. That's inherent in the dog's behavior. So that's why this is the way it is and so forth. So and people need to understand that. If a dog is injured, you gotta be careful how you handle that situation. You wanna help the dog and yet you're subjecting yourself to injury. Number six. Number C says testimony of a certified applied behaviorist or board certified veterinary behaviorist of another recognized expert that may be relevant to the determination of whether the dog's behavior was justified pursuant to the provisions of this section. If deemed dangerous, the administrator or his designee or the director shall order the dog's owner to pay a $50 public safety fine to be deposited into the pet population control fund. The dog to be spayed or neutered within 14 days at the owner's expense and microchipped if not already. And three, one or more of the following is deemed appropriate under circumstances as necessary for protection of the public. Evaluation of the dog by a certified applied behaviorist, a board certified veterinary behaviorist, or another recognized expert in the field and completion of training or other treatment is deemed appropriate by the expert. The owner of the dog shall be responsible for all costs associated with evaluations and training ordered under this subsection. Or direct supervision by an adult 18 years of age or older whenever the animal is on public premises. First question I have on that one goes back to number one there about a $50 public safety fine. You know, leave that the way it is or make it more? How is that different from the fine earlier? Because that was a public safety fine. No, also. for a vicious dog. This is a dangerous dog. That's okay. the only difference that I can see. What's the difference between dangerous and vicious? Well, that's what we're, what we've just been going through. Yeah. Well, you might as well change it. Make it a hundred. I say, what are you going to have else do? Okay, with me. Oh. <laughs> Number E. Administrator may order a dangerous dog to be muzzled whenever it is on public premises in a manner that will prevent it from biting any person or animal, but it shall, it shall not injure the dog or interfere with its vision or respiration. I guess that's fine. Common sense would tell many people if they suspect their dog to do something like that to muzzle it. It's not hard to muzzle the dog. Guide dogs for the blind or hearing impaired, support dogs for the physically handicapped, or sentry guard or police owned dogs are exempt from this section, provided an attack or injury to a person occurs while a dog is performing duties as expected. To qualify for exemption under this Section each dog shall be currently inoculated against rabies in accordance with section 629 on employment duties 
as expected. It shall be the duty of the owner of the exempted dog to notify the administrator of changes of address. In the case of a sentry or guard dog, the owner shall keep the administrator advised of the location where such dog will be stationed. The administrator shall provide police and fire departments with a categorized list of the exempted dogs and shall promptly notify the departments of any address changes reported to him. I don't know we have any dogs like that right now, but I guess it's important to, to know that. For example, the notifying the police and fire departments is important if they have to go to the premises and know there's a vicious or dangerous dog there. If I was a policeman or fireman, I'd sure want to know about it ahead of time. Right, Jim? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> G, animal control agency has the right to impound a dangerous dog if the owner fails to comply with the requirements of this division. I guess we're running out of time, so maybe, maybe this is a good place to stop. appointments if we have any will be made at the county board we have some claims here this morning i believe a copy of these claims was emailed to everybody so we have a motion to approve the claims and second mr barons are there any questions or comments on the claims they're all claims for Emergency management. Seeing that nobody has any questions, we can call the roll, please. Barons? Yes. All? Yes. All full? Yes. What all? Yes. <coughs> yes. I'm going to see correspondence on this. It's been the age of what we're supposed to do correspondence. This goes to business correspondence. In with this one we always give money back from ucci the money isn't attached to that but that tells you what we recently received from ucci for county board members attending meetings and so forth
Okay. You was absent for correspondence this morning. Yeah. What? Do you have any old business to come before the committee? Do we have any new business? Motion to adjourn. I so move to adjourn. Second. Mr. Barron, all in favor say aye. Aye. All same sign, and we are adjourned. We're done.